couldn't hear anything you were saying. Okay. So I'm going to raise it up a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Jeff Thompson. Uh, Jeff Thompson is president and CEO of the Institute of Management Accountants. Since assuming this position in 2008, Thompson has led the development of a strategy resulting in IMA becoming one of the fastest growing accounting associations in the world, with nearly 30% growth in its CMA program and more than 300 student and professional chapters. Currently, IMA has about 80,000 members in 140 countries. Prior to joining IMA, Thompson worked at AT&T for more than two decades, where he served in various financial, strategic, and operational roles. In his last position at AT&T, he served as the CFO for business sales, an $18 billion operation. Thompson has been named by Accounting Today as one of the 100, or top 100 influencers in the profession for five consecutive years. Thompson is an avid New York Mets fan and adopted two boys as teenagers, one from Ecuador and one from Uruguay. We'd like to welcome Jeff Thompson. Thank you, uh, Nadir, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I forget, write this down, Sovereign Fiscal Responsibility Index. Mr. Anton asked me to uh, give you that index. Uh, I'll repeat it again, Sovereign, I got that right, right? Sovereign, Sovereign Fiscal Responsibility Index. And in that index, um, the U.S. was number 28 out of all the countries in the world. So of all the things I had to remember, that was the first thing I had to remember. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. I want to uh, echo what Greg had to say in terms of just a, a beautiful place for learning and growth and education and two-way learning. Uh, it really, really is uh, a beautiful campus. It's my first time on campus. IMA has a student chapter here, but um, it really is a beautiful place to learn and grow and learn from each other. The other comment I'll make is just kudos to the partners and business team, Trevor and Nadir, my, my personal host, uh, who's done a great job. Uh, they really, really are a class act. So uh, let's kind of give them a quick round of applause. And you know, when uh, Nadir and I traded uh, emails a week or so ago, and he said, you know, tell us something a little different or, you know, not related necessarily to business. It's a little bit about family. Well, a week or so ago, I figured the Mets would have won the World Series and I could be a long suffering but now proud Mets fan. But of course, we know it went south, so um, it is what it is. All right. so. My, um, I'm going to bring it down a level from what Greg did, which was just an outstanding talk, a little bit scary, a little bit sobering, but certainly a call to action. So I'm going to bring it down to the uh, level of the profession. I'm going to be talking quite a bit about careers, organizations, and society. Uh, a lot of it is leveraging my experience as a former CFO in industry. So. Think about the period that I worked at AT&T and Telecom, 1979 to 2003, just a tumultuous period of regulation, deregulation, competition, buying companies, selling companies, uh, pricing minutes below variable cost, wireless build-outs in anticipation of if you build it, they will come. So I saw firsthand back then, you know, over a decade ago, the evolving role of the CFO and the CFO team. And when I use the term management accounting, management accountants, really it's synonymous with the CFO team in industry, in organizations of any size, any structure, anywhere. And that primarily is going to be my focus uh, in the talk today. So uh, the agenda is I'm going to just talk about some headlines across the profession of accounting. And hopefully this relates to both students and academics and uh, pr practitioners, of course I said both and I mentioned three, so it shows you how well I can count. <laughs> but it'll get, oh, the other scary thing is I'm a math major, so <laughs> very, very scary. Uh, I, I talk about what makes for a great career, and again, I think this may or may not resonate with all three groups. Uh, what does a career in accounting look like? And it's, the one thing about careers in accounting, first of all, I'm a glass half full 
uh, overflowing with uh, confidence type of person. Um, you know, their careers in accounting are enriching and inspiring and varied, but preparation is absolutely key. And we're going to talk about what is accounting, actually, and you're going to maybe be surprised that it's much more evolved and broader and broadening than you would have ever thought. Uh, we then talk about um, kind of like what does a CFO do, right? What does a CFO do? What, what are they expected to influence? What do they have direct responsibility and direct? And obviously, I'm going to be fairly generic. This isn't a one size fits all, but there might be some relevance. Um, I then relate to current issues and future trends in our profession. I picked a few. Uh, certainly what Greg talked about is kind of the, you know, the macroeconomic type of indicators, uh, which are overlays into what our profession faces. Um, you know, obviously I'm going to end where I started in terms of the incredible career opportunities and, you know, charting your path and be, being opportunistic with the right skill set and the right set of competencies. And, um, and I'll talk a bit at the end uh, before we take questions and please have be thinking about questions on any topic. It could be careers, it could be the profession, it could be IMA, it could be whatever you'd like it to be. But the tools and resources gets a little bit more specific to the IMA, CMA level um, in terms of our certification. But I wanted to do that at the very end to set the stage for the environmental context. So with that, we're going to uh, switch over to a, um, a video that I tried to embed myself last night, which is why it doesn't work. So the deer has to help me out here. <laughs> it's just about a one minute video and it talks about the evolving role of the accountant in the financial professional and industry. And one thing that you're gonna see is that uh, when you think about the expectations of today's CFO team and in industry, let's see if we're ready yet. Well, let me keep going. In terms of the role of today's uh, CFO and CFO team and in industry, it really fuses together many, many competencies. Um, it starts with an accounting foundation. So you absolutely must have that solid accounting foundation. On top of that accounting foundation, I'm going to kind of talk about the fused set of competencies. I call them, we're ready to go. <laughs> That's okay. So, a little bit of an advertisement for Oracle, that was not the intention, obviously, but when you think about um, when I started out as a junior accountant and finance manager, became CFO and began to see this evolution, the bottom line is look at all of the skills and competencies that have been fused together. Um, so it starts with technical accounting as the foundation. So you must absolutely be competent in financial accounting standards, closing the books. If you're a publicly traded company, that's the K's and the Q's. If you're a non-for-profit, that's the 990s. Uh, internal controls, if you're a publicly traded company, Sarbanes-Oxley, SOX 404. All of that technical accounting foundation. But there are additional competencies that are expected and required of today's CFO team in industry. Again, 
This is not just large companies like the one I came from, but it's smaller, mid-sized companies, for-profit, non-for-profit, anywhere in the world. So in addition to technical accounting, let me rattle off some of the other competencies that you saw stated or implied. Accounting, finance, strategy, operations, technology, and add in a dose of governance and leadership, right? So I think you know where I'm building here. This is the real world. Uh, I've been out of industry for 10 years, uh, but this was the expectation of me. And this going forward is the expectation is the question is, how do we source the, how do we get the talent? Now, you're not gonna get it all coming out of school, but certainly having a solid foundation of technical accounting. Of course, we promote certification, experiential learning, internships, being opportunistic and seeking the next opportunity, even stepping out of finance and accounting to grow your skill set to understand how value is generated in the enterprise. So let's talk about um, headlines across the profession. So strong demand, strong demand for the skill sets that we bring to the table. And let me cite three sources. Um, one source is the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, of course, U.S. only, states that between now and 2025, so about the next decade, accounting and auditing will be one of the faster growing professions. And of course, we trust the government, <laughs> but it is a source. Um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, double digit growth between now and 2025 in aud auditing and accounting type positions. Another source is the AICPA 2015 trends report. So every two years, the AICPA puts out a trends report that talks about supply and demand for undergraduate accounting. And once again this year, that report is very positive in terms of the demand trend. And then finally, I point overseas to what is still, I believe, the world's number two economy, uh, and that's China, which is recovering a bit. But in the last two or three years, the Chinese government has articulated the need and demand for management accounting. And by the way, very quickly, management accounting is more of the forward-looking uh, type of accounting vis-a-vis uh, -vis value creation, FP&A, financial planning and analysis, merger and acquisition activity. That kind of thing is loosely how we define management accounting, which I'll expand on in a minute. But in the government of China, in the last two or three years, now that they've got a pretty good handle on financial accounting standards and IFRS and COSO internal controls, they're now evolving into the value creation side of the CFO expectation, and that's management accounting. And the Chinese government has indicated that they need to fill over the next five or so years about two million types of positions in management accounting. So there is demand. Uh, generally speaking, salaries are higher, uh, but again, there are significant challenges in addressing the talent that's required to fill these kind of positions. Uh, again, uh, enriching careers, um, when you think about it, um, let me give you a high-end example and a, a smaller company example. In terms of a high-end example, um, there was a study by McKinsey uh, a few years ago that indicated that the proportion of COOs or chief operating officers in the industry is declining. So the question is, are operations going away? Or where is this functionality going to? Where is this accountability going to? And of course, the answer is what? Where, generally speaking, is the COO's responsibility moving to in the C-suite? What do you think? CFO, right? Or the CEO. So when you think about the role of the COO, the chief operating officer, uh, it could encompass many things depending upon the company size but it's typically gonna involve the supply chain, customer ordering, fulfillment, uh, provisioning, it could include human resources, it could include customer service, it could include a lot of things. So now, increasingly, the CFO, to the extent that there is a, um, a set of responsibilities that I just described, which clearly there are, is picking up more operational responsibility. Now look, the CFO can't be 
technically adept in every single competencies. But you saw on the video the notion of asking the right questions, having the fierce conversations, and providing the appropriate level of oversight, not just on the customer order to cash process, but over things like Salesforce automation. Right? So again, when I'm painting a picture here it's for an expanding and evolving role of the management accountant and the CFO in industry. Let me go to a, a smaller example, right? Not just a big company. So smaller companies generally won't have COOs, right? So IMA, now look, IMA is a multinational corporation. Uh, we uh, serve the world. We have members in 140 countries, six or so offices around the world, including China, 80,000 members, et cetera, et cetera. So in every, every measure, we are a multinational corporation. But in terms of employees and revenue and net assets, we're a small company, right? We're a small business. Well, I often refer to um, the chief financial officer in a smaller company as the OFO, the only financial officer, right? So our CFO, Doreen Remen, um, she's our CFO. So what does she do as CFO? The traditional thing. She closes the books. She's the controller. Uh, she files the 990 with the IRS once a year, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to that, in a small but not multinational corporation, she's also responsible for leading our strategic planning process. So this is real world. Re our leading our strategic planning process. We have a four-year rolling plan, right? She leads that whole process of, en of envisioning the future and innovation and competition. Yes, there is competition in our environment. Um, in addition to that, she heads up human resources, technology, and customer service. And oh, by the way, building maintenance, because we own our building in Montfield, New Jersey. So the notion that the CFO, the management accountant, the CFO team is solely and only responsible for the critical but very focused task of closing the books and internal controls, those days are, are long gone. Those days are long gone. And high expectations. You know, the CFO is being asked to do more with less. They're being asked to be an influencer. Uh, they're asked to make sure that we have, you know, no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in terms of our internal controls over financial reporting, while also leading the strategic plan, also being involved early on in the innovation process and entrepreneurial activity of the enterprise, right? So what makes for a great career and does our profession pass the test? Now, I already told you I'm the eternal optimist, the glasses overflowing type. Um, I do deal with reality and, and disruption, but you know, here it goes. <coughs> and of course, I have check marks in front of all of them before you even see them. So it kind of tells you how optimistic I am. Um, <laughs> look, our profession is growing and respected. Um, we must lead the way before we get into this strategic partnering and business partnering and operations and technology and ERPs and CR. We must be the trusted source from an ethical perspective and from a core values perspective. If not us, as finance and accounting professionals, who? If not us, who? So at the very foundation of us being a growing, storied, respected profession, we must raise our game on professional ethics. We must inculcate it more directly into our curricula Accounting associations like ours have a responsibility to talk about the gray zone that you don't want to get too close to in terms of ethical dilemmas. You know, it used to be when you would, you know, when I took courses back way, way, way back in the day, you know, it was all about making money and shareholder value and the quest for value and EVA and all this other stuff. Very, very important. But if you go too far with that mindset is, you know, you, you want to make sure you behave and you grow in an ethical way. I often say that any company these days pretty much aspires to grow in some way, but it's only the great companies that aspire to grow with confidence and integrity. 
with court with ethics as its foundation. Uh, more than a job and enriching career. So many of you are possibly thinking about your first career in audit public accounting. I, I encourage that career. My own granddaughter, Stephanie, uh, is got her master's degree in accounting back in New Jersey and wants to go that audit track. And she said, what do I, what do I think? Because you're kind of on the management accounting side. And I said, well, you, know, you've, you follow what you want to do. You know, you're smart enough. You, you know. Um, all I can do is help guide you. And by the way, starting out in a public accounting firm, whether it's a large firm, a regional firm, a local firm, is a great, great way to learn about an industry vertical. So if you're assigned to a pharmaceutical company, what a great way to learn how value flows, how customers behave, how R&D is treated, you know, all those kinds of things, the lifeblood of the business. What an incredible way. That said, public accounting is not the only career. That's the only message that IMA gives. It is not the only career. A vast majority of students, undergraduate accounting students, who enter the public accounting track within three to four years, a vast majority within three to four, four years, find their way into industry. And then there's all kinds of pathways. You could start in public and go into industry. You could go back to public. You might be in... Um, industry and say, you know what, I'm on the track to become controller of a subsidiary or CFO, but I really should step out or my, my companies encourage me to step out and run a customer service center like I did, which was really scary. Anybody ever get mad at the phone company? <laughs> um, so my point about it is let's just be aware of multiple career paths and career options and be prepared for them. Be prepared with technical competencies, credentialing, experiential learning, and being opportunistic, being opportunistic. So I might just be a little bit biased. Um, higher than average salary, for example, and I'm sure AICPA does similar surveys, but we've done surveys, um, and what the surveys show is that on average across the world, CMAs or chief are uh, certified management accountants earn about 60% more on average than those who are not certified. So there is a certification premium. CMA, CPA, CAI, CA, CIA, sorry, CFE, et cetera. Ability to make a difference and be an influencer. To be a differentiator and an influencer, what a great opportunity to grow and learn. So when you think about all that my CFO influences across IMA, and many of you are members, and when you think about what I had the opportunity over a decade ago to influence, you know, it's two elements, right? One element that's traditional and one element that's growing and evolving. The traditional element of responsibility and influence is what I call value stewardship. Protecting assets, safeguarding of assets, you know, the internal controls, the financial statements, the audit and attestation compliance, critical role to accurately portray financial condition, financial position of an enterprise with statement of activities and sound internal controls. But the evolving, growing role, in addition to all that from a responsibility and influence perspective, is the value creation. All the things that I alluded to earlier, FP&A. When we do surveys, um, financial planning analysis, when we do surveys and we ask CFOs, what is today still the greatest pain point I mean, they'll put things like disruptive technologies, they'll put things like customer sophistication, um, but they also put up there um, the fact that they can't, they don't necessarily have the radar that they need to anticipate future events, right? So, but they also put, in addition to that forward looking radar, right, that strategic planning, um, triggering type of things for disruption, they also put FP&A up at the top of the list of their number one pain point. And heck, we've been doing budgets since the beginning of time. But let's face it, budgets, long-term forecasts are often gamed, are not stretch, take forever, are rear view mirror with KPIs and not forward driven with leading indicators. So 
it is a big, big area of focus for technical competency to help fill gaps. And then who says accountants can't be fun, right? Aren't we the life of the party? <laughs> All right, not, not a good test. Aren't we the life of the party? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Work with me here. <laughs> All right, so much for that. I'll memo to self, take that off, slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so what does a career management accounting look like? I mean, I've kind of given it away, and it's hard to capture in one graphic, one matrix, but who we are, what we do, where we work, this is just a sample. And let's see, I'm, I'm really bad with colors, but the, let's call it blue, is where we work. So these are, or is it purple? I don't know, blue, all right, close enough. Um, so where we work, right? So for-profit, non-for-profit, government, etc. The um, orange would that be? The orange is, are the kind of job titles, right? And so they could range from VP of finance to finance or accounting manager, controller, CFO, etc. And by the way, many management accountants don't even work in finance and accounting. Sometimes they work in product groups. Sometimes they do the but in, in larger companies. Uh, we had liaisons inside of our big product and marketing groups that actually were management accountants. They happen to sit outside of finance and accounting, right? I often say that the key word in management accounting is actually management, right? The accounting is the technical accounting foundation, but the management part is the fact that we're expected to do more than report financials, for example. We're expected to offer insights and analysis and what does it mean? So it's not so much the information, it's the insight. It's not so much the data, it's the decisions, right? So even as a junior, you know, responsible for um, a small business or product line, you know, I had to go in there not just, you know, not just talking about the accruals and the manual journal entries, but I had to explain the results in a way that had a future orientation because that's what business is all about. It's not what you did for me yesterday. I understand that. I trust you. You know, you've got sound business processes, internal controls, and all that. It's helped me anticipate and plan and get ahead of a future. That's really what our job is when you think about it. And then finally, the, I guess that would be green, right? Uh, the green is things that we do that we've already talked about, strategic development, information, budgeting, and forecasting, internal controls. So. Um, we'll see if I, as you can tell, I do my own PowerPoints. I don't rely on administrative staff. Uh, they're busy enabling others. The downside is me running into Trevor this morning and saying, oh, I have another video I loaded and of course it doesn't work. So we'll see if, um, we'll see if this one works and if it doesn't, we'll just move on. By the way, before I am very confident and hit, hit play, um, I talk about the leadership premium here. So look, leadership is a body of knowledge. Uh, if you look, if you read books by John C. Maxwell or John Cotter or, you know, leadership guru, Stephen Covey, it is a body of knowledge, okay? It absolutely is a body of knowledge. But let's face it, leadership is, is as experiential as it gets. Now, here's why leadership is so important um, for CFOs and CFO teams and management accountants as influencers. It's all about the conversation. So picture this, um, you're Jeff Thompson, <laughs> you're midway in your career at AT&T, uh, you aspire to do bigger and better things, nothing wrong with that. Uh, you become uh, what's called CFO business partner to the sales force, all right? 8,000 person sales force, $18 billion in revenue. And you're, you're Jeff and you're sitting down with, let's call him Ken Sishow, <laughs> the sales officer, uh, two or three levels above little old Jeff. And Jeff and Ken are having a conversation. They're talking about revenue projections for the business unit. And Ken starts out by saying, well, Jeff, I, 
grew 4% last year, uh, put 6% in the budget, put 6% in the budget, revenue growth, right? I'm growing at 4% last year, 6% this year, sounds pretty good, he's two, three levels above me. Uh, I'm on the finance team supporting him, he's the sales officer. End of conversation, no, absolutely not. I have to demonstrate enough leadership and influence and courage to have a conversation. And if it's a fierce conversation, so be it. Fierce doesn't have to be respectful. Fierce has to be direct and respectful. And it, there's nothing wrong with a data-driven approach. So I'll say to Ken, Ken, um, I understand 4% to 6%, that's a nice healthy increase, but I've done some competitive analysis. And by the way, this is all true. <laughs> There is a real Jeff and there was a real Ken. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but Ken, I've done some competitive analysis. I've taken a look at the growth of MCI WorldCom, I've Sprint, Celex, local companies, cable, DSL. And you know, the market growth rate is kind of like around 12%. And when we adjust for product mix and you know other mix things, that maybe makes it eight to 10%. So we really should be striving for something more like 8%. And Ken says, well, I can kind of buy that, but how do we go from 6% to 8% and we, or 10%? We said, well, you know what? Let's set up a greenfield session. Let's get the right people in the room. Let's identify our run rate performance and incremental initiatives, market-based initiatives that will get us from our run rate of 6% up to more of a market run rate of 10%. Let's identify those incremental initiatives. Let's figure out how to fund them. Let's have the conversation. Well, just think about some of the dynamics here. You're kind of early, mid-level in your career, a well-established sales officer, you know, with a big fancy office and a balcony. You know, salespeople can be strong and intimidating at times. Just think about that dynamic. But I had an obligation and we have an obligation and hopefully we have enablement from our CFOs to have the conversation, all right? So if this works, we're gonna see if it works and um, it's a bad example of leadership from, oh, if you wouldn't, we'll give it a try. This way if it doesn't, I could just skate right into the next slide. But this is a bad example of leadership just to, just to give you an idea. Oh, good sign. There might be a commercial, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, it'll take a second. I liked it. Did we just start looking for a house? It looks pretty good. Yeah. All right. Oh, did you see that commercial. listing on Zillow I sent you? Yep. You see that bathroom? That's on it. Escape out. Well, I think that's the Me way. too. I think it's just the normal okay. commercial that comes up. <sighs> Do we just decide to buy a house? I think so. Find your way home. Zillow. Oh. Hello. Hey, Michael. Yes. You got Jim there with you? No, it's just us. Actually, can you call Jim in? I want him on. Please. Oh. Oh, well, here he is right now. Come in. Hi, David. Hey, guys. So, I spoke to Alan. We had kind of an unconventional idea, which I think is pretty cool, but it only works if everyone's on board. Well, just as long as it means Jim becomes a manager. We were thinking of having two branch managers in Scranton, both of you guys working as co-managers. Jim would handle the day-to-day, -day, and Michael, you would focus on clients and big picture stuff. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. I like that. So, manager and co-manager. Co-manager and co-manager. See, there are a lot of moving pieces, and this is the only way I can sell it upstairs. Well, that might be a little confusing for people because they know me as manager. All right. Hey, Michael, can you pick up for one second? Okay, look, I'm not going to force you into anything. If you're willing to lose Jim, fine. You just say so, we'll find another solution. Okay? Is that what you want to do? <laughs> okay, people. This
announcement to make. everybody. I have, I have an, an announcement, announcement to, make. to make. Fraud was committed Ooh, in... Do you have an announcement? I, I'm, I was making it. Everybody, David Wallace and I have talked, and we have decided to promote Jim to the position of co-manager. Co-manager of what? Of your butt. And your butt, and your butt, and your butt, all of Scranton Branch butts. What's happening to you, Michael? What's happening to me? I am also being promoted to co-manager. We will be co-managers together. Jim Halpert, welcome. Thank you. So who says accountants can't have fun, right? <laughs> so not a, uh, not a great example of the leadership premium and thank you to Deer for navigating that so well. So let's talk a little bit more. I mean, I've kind of set this up already. So um, whenever I see that 15 minute warning, I'll be ready to go uh, and get your questions and thoughts. Um, so here's a, slide that I like to use. It's called the four lines of sight for today's management accountant, CFO, CFO team. And again, it bridges together the value stewardship and the value creation uh, expectations of <clears throat> the responsibility. So on the two extremes, the two uh, lines of sight there are the more traditional value stewardship, value protection, value preservation responsibilities. The traditional roles of oversight, and hindsight, and that sounds a little bit negative, but oversight is the CFO's responsibility, oversight for funding and business cases, and if a new innovation project prototype to fund that resource allocation, uh, that oversight could include, uh, if it's a larger organization, centralized, consolidated responsibility for the strategic planning process. Um, so it's that oversight. The uh, far right is uh, the hindsight, right? And that's the you know, reporting of historical financial results and internal controls, the audit attestations. But again, it's the two inner ones that uh, we need to step up to in terms of competencies and uh, talent, the talent gap. And of course, inside is insight and foresight. And so uh, we were actually chatting last night and you know, increasingly business is faced with complexity and shocks and disruption. It could be um, a, co a competitor, it could be technology, it could be an economic situation that breaks. Uh, it could be that this great new provisioning system that you put in place failed. It could be that you were just attacked or attacked as we're speaking by a cyber hacker, right? It, all these things could happen and so Dealing with disruption, having a disaster recovery plan, a crisis management plan is really only part of it. Uh, being able to deal with disruption and complexity of running businesses today is as much the responsibility of the CFO working with the CEO and his or her team. And um, so when I talk about uh, insight, you know, I use the simple examples before of uh, financial statement reporting um, and financial statement reporting is even going beyond financial statements to non-financial indicators of performance. Yes, the variance is, analysis is nice, the delta P, the delta Q, but give me the insight, give me your acumen, give me your experience, give, give me the collective wisdom of the team. What intervention should we make? So at IMA, we review financial statements every month. I actually have an app. Um, I checked this morning where I can check all of our KPIs on a daily basis. I can see how many members we have, how many members in China, how many new candidates. Um, sometimes I try not to look at it every day, <laughs> like the stock market, but that ability to look at leading indicators and anticipate and develop interventions or new ideas, new strategies is as much our responsibility as it is reporting in an accurate, ethical way what already happened. And then the foresight similarly. You know, I had a slide in here um, that I forgot, or I forgot to include it in this package on the innovation process. So innovation is an area that IMA is getting very, very deep into because we believe that innovation could be um, a lot of PR, 
uh, kind of a one-hit wonder, brag to your board, oh, we created a new product, so that's innovation. No, innovation is a body of knowledge. Innovation is uh, uh, something that you need to understand what it is and what it isn't. Um, one of my favorite quotes on innovation is, uh, don't let what you know limit what you can imagine. Don't let what you know limit what you can imagine. Now you might say, what kind of innovation can you do within the finance and accounting value chain? There's a lot you can do. But when you think about the expanded role of the CFO and the CFO team management accountant and influencing operations, that is an area that we are focused on. So we're focused on innovation measurement, innovation governance, and the role of the CFO. It used to be an innovation which usually starts with an idea and then a prototype and some experimentation um, really quick just to kind of see if the idea uh, passes water. It, it used to be that the CFO got involved late in the stage when, let's say, the prototype has worked on this particular idea to improve customer service, let's say. And Mr. and Ms. CFO or finance manager, hey, we need about $125,000 in incremental funding, you know, where's the checkbook? Today, the CFO, the CFO team, and this is real world at IMA, is involved from the front end of the innovation cycle. And the reason I talk about innovation and kind of slip that in here in the foresight is because when you think about the challenges that industry face today of competition, consolidation, commoditization, commoditization is essentially where virtually anything can be copied. I would argue that the first mover advantage of yesteryear becomes such a short first mover advantage that sometimes you're better off being a late mover or a second mover. It depends on the circumstance, the nature of the technology, and the maturity curve of the organization. But because of these challenges, there's only a few ways out, right? One is innovation and take a serious look at innovation and understanding what it is, what it isn't, as I said before. And the other is service the soul of service, the relationship management, the name of this conference is partners in business, right? The personal relationships, the business relationships. You know, I often say in China, it's relationships on steroids, right? You really need to nurture those personal business relationships. I hope the digital age and social media never takes that away. I don't think it will, but, um, you know, that is where differentiation can occur. Anybody that's flown an airline knows what I mean in terms of just little service things that can be done to make the difference uh, between one carrier and another carrier. So that's the lines of sight. Um, we're okay on time? 17 minutes, okay, so I'll go another few minutes then we'll, so be thinking about your questions, good opportunity again any subject you'd like, the profession, careers, IMA, non for whatever, whatever you'd like, be thinking about it. So current issues and future trends, I already alluded to some. This one's a little bit technical, but um, you know, IFRS and uh, corporate reporting or integrated reporting. So the US is nowhere near uh, IFRS. We'll be on US GAAP for the foreseeable future. Uh, one thing I find interesting about IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, which I believe is in about 120, 140 countries, is not, a, not every country has the same standard version of IFRS. Uh, they nationalize, in China and Japan, for example, they take the IASB standards and nationalize it like for fair value and other types of things. So if the goal is pure comparability, pure comparability across the border, across the borders of financial statements, income statements, balance sheets. It's unclear to me how having, in some cases, nationalized versions of IFRS standards achieves that comparability. The other comment I would make is, is it comparability that we're looking for or comparability with high quality financial standards? Now, I'm not a big fan of U.S. GAAP in terms of the volumes of pages on, you know, revenue recognition before the convergence with I. But you know what? I think it's hard to argue that um, U.S. GAAP is not of the highest quality financial standards. It's too complex, needs to be simplified. So this is a whole area of debate. It's less so right now, to, at least for the next five years, probably longer, the U.S. is staying on uh, generally accepted accounting principles. 
But the area of integrated reporting is the notion that in order to describe the value creation capacity and capability of an enterprise, it's more than just financial performance. It's non-financial performance. It's employees. It's innovation. It's R&D. It's customers. And this whole body of knowledge is referred to as integrated reporting, and it's a very, very hot area outside the U.S., but increasingly inside the U.S. Google on SASB, uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, U.K.-based organization that looks at non-financial measures that are material to investors focused in the sustainability space. And so I'm going to, because I think I mentioned all of these, um, actually I'm going, so the CMA program um, is certainly part of the gap filler, management accounting certification, um, other certifications. This is a study we did, 90% of organizations having a hard time hiring the right entry level talent this is supply versus demand, gaps, as you'd expect in leadership. You don't come out of the gate with leadership skill. It is very much learned and experiential. But gaps in planning, budgeting, and forecasting, as I alluded to earlier, one of the major pain points of CFOs, and certainly gaps in strategic thinking and execution, right? So I'm going to skip all through this. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the CMA program, I said I would do this at the very end. It's a two-part exam. The exam's been around for about 44 years. You look at those competencies in two exam parts, and they're essentially where the biggest gaps exist. We did form a honor society recently. Uh, for students, you don't have to be an IMA member. But what we're trying to do here with this it's not a club, it's a recognition. What we're trying to do with the IMA Accounting Honor Society is create greater awareness of management accounting. Now, the good news is that others are talking about the value of management accounting in the profession and society, the AICPA, the government of China, and that's all a good thing. That's all a good thing, but we have to do everything we can. So they're the criteria if you're interested, and I don't know, I'm still, is it bearish or bullish? Bearish, right? Positive, optimistic, bullish. bullish. <laughs> I can't count and I don't know my, <laughs> my bulls from my bears. So I'm really uh, bullish on the profession. Look, I know the challenges. I started out as an accounting manager in finance. I know the challenges that we face, but my job is just to create the call to action and the step, step up in skill, competency, and experiences. So with that, your turn. So open it up for any comments or questions, and I think we've done pretty good on time. Yes. So I'll repeat the question. Um, so I, apparently I can't count. I don't know my bears for my bulls, and I didn't know that ethicality was a word. So it's very, very impressive. <laughs> um, so the question was, um, how do you build a culture of ethics? Or do we think ethicality is a word? Is it? Because I'll start using it <laughs> to impress people. <laughs> but I don't want to get in trouble. Um, no, but seriously, uh, so the question was, look, we face dilemmas, and how do, it's a word. All right, I'm going to use a new word. <laughs> um, how, do we, how do we deal with the gray zone, right? Um, because we face it, right? I faced earnings management, right? Everybody hear the term earnings management? Um, and so one thing that we find is very helpful is to look at cases and learn from them and develop some thinking. So when you think about, you say, well, how about having a statement of ethics and, um, and similar types of things? Well, you know, Enron 
and I'm not an expert on the Enron case, but I know enough about it. They had a beautiful statement of ethics, just gorgeous. My friends at MCI WorldCom, and I use that term loosely, um, had a beautiful statement of ethics. So there's one of the foundational things is education. So whether it's uh, university or IMA or AICPA, it's providing real cases of ethical dilemmas. And in the case of Diamond Foods, so IMA has a fraud series, and our latest case was Diamond Foods, a San Francisco-based uh, provider of walnuts and, and all kinds of things like that. 2011, 2012, they had some issues with respect to earnings management. And what we go is we go through that case and we take IMA's statement of ethical professional practice and we say, what could this organization have done? Now, they were faced with higher costs from their growers, from their uh, walnut growers, higher costs, and yet they were under intense pressure as a publicly traded company to report earnings at a certain level. And look, at the end of the day, they did the wrong thing. They, they booked revenues that they had no ability to collect. Uh, they artificially deflated costs. But there are things that you can do to ethically manage earnings, and it's not even a good term saying it that way. And so a lot of it is guidance and education, but a lot of it too is, is I hate the term tone at the top, because tone at the top is expected. It's toned throughout. And let me kind of tell you a simple thing we do at IMA in addition to education and giving real cases of ethical dilemmas. One thing that we do at IMA that we we found very helpful is, and we do the ethics training and all that, but we implemented these core values that sit side by side with our statement of ethical professional practice. Five core values, and you say, all right, well, what prevents them from going up on the wall, they're in Jeff's office, they're outside, his, you know. Well, here's what we do. Inside of everybody's incentive, every single employee at IMA, all, what, 120, 130 of them, every single employee, their livelihood, their promotability, their incentive bonus is dependent not only on what they produce, but how they produce it. So guess what? Those five core values, every time we do the formal annual appraisal, the mid-year appraisal, and conversations in between, the five core values are embedded into that performance management system. So we have conversations about not only what you produced, but how you produced it. This association will not grow in a way that makes our members um, upset. We will grow with confidence and integrity, and we insist upon that. Sometimes people get terminated because they're not coming along for the ride or they behave unethically. Zero tolerance policy. So tone to the top is expected, but it's, darn it, isn't it tone throughout? And how do you make those values real? So education and your incentive system. Now, just like internal controls and audits, it's reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, right? It's th that's the best you can do. Other questions? Yes. All right. Where's Greg? Is Greg still here? <laughs> no. Um, so there, I've, I came from, as you can tell, the environment where I truly believe competition is a good thing. Um, I would have never guessed it 10 years ago when I joined a non-for-profit that there's the level of competition that there is. But I am a believer that competition creates stronger, sharper, more innovative organizations. And I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of that. So. Generally speaking, it's a big market, a big opportunity. Um, it's up to the buyer to decide. And the fact that the AICPA in the last five years and the government of China in the last three years 
is now art are now articulating the societal and organizational value of management accounting is a great thing. And after that, it's up to the buyer. We have a CMA program that we're very proud of. I didn't spend a lot of time on it because I wanted to talk more about the profession and careers. Uh, but line them up and, and decide. I'd rather somebody get a certification in management accounting than no certification in management accounting. And then, of course, right after that, CMA would be great. You know, CMA is two parts, very focused, very relevant. There's an education requirement, an experience requirement. Every single person who's a CMA around the world, including me, had to take an exam. Our standards are very high. We don't care about big numbers. If we get the big numbers, great. As Nadir said, we're one of the fastest growing accounting associations in the world. CMA program growing 30%. But when I make those statements, I want my members and the profession to be proud. Every single person, well, except for one, but every single one of the 50,000 who have been certified took a rigorous, robust, and relevant exam. You know who that one person was who didn't take the exam? And it wasn't me. It was the founder of the exam, Dr. James Bullock. He created the exam, and I guess they said, hey, you know what? You're a CMA. <laughs> You're CMA number one. So remember, it's not just about growing. It's growing with confidence and integrity, always. Yes? Yes? Yeah, so the, um, the question was that there's been an evolution or a migration of um, activities from, let's say, transaction processing, closing the books, to the uh, quote-unquote more value-added activities. I prefer to call it more forward-looking activities because everything adds value, right? Well. It is a reality in our profession when you think about technology, you think about robotics. I mean, you take a look at an Amazon plant and you don't see too many human beings. You know, robotics, artificial intelligence, you know, all of these things that, you know, like when Back in the Future was made, <laughs> I mean, they really are becoming reality. So what happens is that those uh, more routine systematic tasks, whether it's outsourcing, offshoring, shared services, robotics, yeah, there is a displacement factor. Um, there absolutely is a displacement factor. Now, there is a concern that the knowledge there of those repetitive tasks um, can't be replicated, but that is a reality. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that the human element will ever totally go away, but being prepared with an analytical mindset and skills and competencies because it's going to take a while for those higher order relationship management activities to get replaced if they ever really get replaced. So it is a reality. It is a reality of our profession from a technology enablement perspective and a technology displacement. The question is, you know, are you able to kind of ride that curve into more of the quote unquote decision support activity? Okay. So I think we're good. So thank you for your time. I'm glad the two videos work. My day is done. <laughs> Thanks a lot. On behalf of Utah State University and Partners in Business, we'd like to thank Jeff for coming. If we can get him another round of applause. Um, we'd like to remind you guys to take the survey on the Partners in Business app. You can download that from the Apple App Store or the Android Play Store. Um, next up, we have uh, one of two breakout sessions. Breakout session one is entitled Accounting and Financial Reporting Update. It is hosted by Morgan Miles, an audit manager at Deloitte, and Wes Yeomans, a partner at Deloitte. The other uh, Breakout session is entitled Federal Tax Update. It is hosted by Doug Arviseth, a tax partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Kristen Saxton, a tax director at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And those will be in one of the two rooms out here to your right.